Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Neil Bartlett's play Jekyll and Hyde, which is obviously an adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's novel, um, and actually the Nick Hearn Books edition, at least, lists Robert Louis Stevenson as the author, and then adapted for the stage by Neil Bartlett. Um, yeah, I'm ambivalent toward the idea that Stevenson is an author of this. Certainly there's small bits that Bartlett takes from Stevenson's novella and incorporates in as dialogue, but it's Neil Bartlett's play. It's not, this is decidedly not Robert Louis Stevenson's version. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm again, ambivalent about this idea that we sometimes get with adaptation that, oh, this is Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde as presented by Neil Bartlett. No, it's Neil Bartlett's play. Sure, it builds off of Jack, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but it isn't that. And we know it's not that because Bartlett's version is very, very different. Thematically, there are similarities, but this is again, one of those many, 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 many stage adaptations of Jekyll and Hyde and if you've watched my, my channel for a while, you know I've done a bunch of videos about different version, different stage versions of this. Um, almost everybody builds in female characters, whereas in Stevenson's novella, there's like half a dozen references to women, none of whom get a name, and none of whom are mentioned, with one exception, none of whom are mentioned for more than about two lines, three lines. In this play, our protagonist is Dr. Stevenson, which, as, um, as Bartlett explains in the character descriptions, Stevenson is a newly qualified doctor recently admitted to a previously all-male profession. She's fairly young and tough, but it's also really important that she's inexperienced. Every man she meets is her superior, and every doctor she meets could get her sack. At key moments, she's dangerously attracted to the glamorous and controversial Dr. Jekyll. She's intimidated by him and also finally pushed beyond her fears into anger and action. So Dr. Stevenson is the protagonist of this play. Um, yes, Jekyll and Hyde are the sort of main object of interest, but Stevenson is the driving force. She's the one who's actually engaged because she is investigating what happened to this little girl. The little girl that at the beginning of Stevenson's novella is trampled in the street by Hyde and then just forgotten about forever. Nobody, nobody cares about her beyond that moment in the novella. In this play, that's the central event, really. Like, that's what drives Dr. Stevenson to investigate this whole thing. Um, and she's very clearly aware of the gender dynamics at play here, because she actually says at pretty much at the beginning of the play, um, after taking her, her medical oath to join this hospital, she says, I was the first woman they'd ever admitted to their hospital. They were polite, of course, but I knew they were judging me, that they wanted me to fail. In addition to which, well, that whole strange affair of Dr. Jekyll was one of my very first serious cases. So what this sets up for is this idea that not only not, Jekyll and Hyde are not an anomaly. Jekyll and Hyde, in fact, are male privilege, the old boys club externalized or physicalized. So the, the idea here, actually what Bartlett does that's really kind of interesting with Hyde is he almost makes Hyde a collective character because we have a chorus of upper class men, society men who frequently perform Jekyll's or Hyde's reactions. So for instance, when Hyde like feels threatened, when, when Stevenson is investigating and, and she's on the right track and Hyde is uh, 
anxious about this, they will all sort of draw back and hiss or something like this. So the idea is that Hyde is not an anomaly. Hyde is this sort of physicalized embodiment of class and gendered violence, at least in Victorian England, um, debatably still even today. Um, so that's one of the really cool elements here. And one of the thematic resonances that's really important. Um, and we see this pretty well throughout the play. <coughs> um, and it's really only, and this is actually kind of true in the novella as well, is really only when Sir Danvers Carew is murdered that society begins to take notice and, and starts to really be concerned about Hyde and what he's doing. So that's an interesting element. Uh, but actually in scene two, in act two, scene 24, we so act two is a weird bit. Um, it, it's much, much shorter than act one. So act one is where the majority of the, the action of the play happens and where um, Stevenson is doing the bulk of her investigation. Act two is this weird sort of like post-mortem explanation of things because Jekyll slash Hyde actually dies at the end of act one. And then in the beginning of act two, he comes back to life maybe. So he's on this, uh, on this gurney, um, or, or whatever it is. He's, he's, yeah, he's on a gurney. Um, what it says here, stage directions, ominous noise, something moves, the sheet is pulled back from the gurney. It isn't Hyde, it sits up, Jekyll. So, what the fuck is going on there? Um, Jekyll is dead, Hyde is dead, but Jekyll is now back to be like, yeah, here's what happened. I did some crazy fucking science and shit went wrong and I murdered some people. Eh, what are you gonna do? It's not quite as casual as that, but it is very callous. Um, and actually, Dr. Lanyon, who also is dead, comes back for Act 2 as well to tell his little bit where he witnessed Hyde transform back into Jekyll. So it's a weird second act that kind of doesn't make that much sense and disrupts the flow of the play in some ways, but it's also... Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is such a difficult play to write well because the novella is so, depends on so much like exposition to build tension, ironically enough, because normally exposition doesn't build tension. Um, but it's very hard to do. It's very hard to stage elements when it's like a character's reactions to things or character's personal experiences with no one else around. But one of the things that we get in, in Act 2, Scene 24, and th there's not a, it's, there aren't more than 24 scenes in Act 2, just they, the scene numbers continue. Um, so the girl who's been around, like the it's Dr. Stevenson, the hospital matron, and the girl have been sort of investigating this. The girl's just been hanging around the hospital, I guess. Dr. Stevenson and the hospital matron have been doing the police's job rather kind of than theirs. And no one seems concerned about that. But anyway, that is what it is. So the girl says, and where was I when you looked in your bloody mirror? Just uh, Jekyll is talking about how he looked in the mirror as Hyde and he saw both himself and not himself, this, you know, split experience. And Dr. Stevenson says, yes, yes, what about her, doctor? Jekyll says, her? Oh, you, my dear, were my first mistake, my first accident, but happily one without consequences. The girl is obviously indignant to this. Um, Stevenson is indignant to this, the hospital matron's indignant to this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this idea that, like, for Jekyll and for Hyde as well, as well as for the rest of the gentlemen, the fact that he just tramples over this girl and physically injures her is a matter of indifference. 
Like, it literally does not make any difference to him that he did this. So we get, again, that element of gendered and class privilege that upper class men can engage in violence, can, can treat people badly, can do whatever it is without any repercussions. So that's a central element here. The other thing that Barrett introduces or draws out is the sort of implications of gay relationships among the upper class men. And of course, this isn't necessarily a surprising bit per se, because um, there's a lot of English literature that revolves or, or that implicitly or explicitly. So there's a lot of homosocial English literature. I'll say, I'll say it that way, particularly from upper class figures or around or surrounding upper class characters, some of which more overtly acknowledges homo homosexual relationships or homosexual activity. Um, particularly among, for instance, like boys at boarding school or uh, people at university or things like this, these traditionally all male spaces in which, of course, sexuality doesn't cease to exist just because there are officially at least no women there. And so this is a very common stereotype. This is a very common literary trope, this idea of um, privileged upper class men or boys having sexual relationships with one another, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and so Bartlett builds on that idea. There's a lot of implications here that um, Hyde is either a male prostitute or is uh, buying male prostitutes. There's the suggestion that um, Jekyll may have been involved in affairs with men the implication is that Sir Danvers Carew was coming back, but either was coming back or was going to um, a sexual relationship with a man, probably a male prostitute, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we get these sort of implications, and some of them are done really just through linguistic play, I guess. Um, some of them are more overt, some of them are more covert, but this is actually one of my favorite bits here. Um, this is in Act 1, Scene 3. Um, they're talking about Jekyll and Hyde, and we have Dr. Stevenson, the matron, the girl, and Utterson, who, again, is the sort of upper-class lawyer friend of Dr. Jekyll. And their supposition is that Jekyll and Hyde are having an affair. Um, so Dr. Stevenson says, so we're on Queer Street, I see. Now, Queer Street in traditional English slang, for those of you not familiar with this term, means something along the lines of financial difficulties. Um, but queer obviously has another meaning. Uh, is a it's a traditional insult that has then been reclaimed under queer theory for LGBT people. Um, so Dr. Stevenson says, so we're on Queer Street, I see. Utterson says, do you, miss? Look, Harry practices. I mean, he conducts experiments, sometimes in an old dissecting theater at the rear of his premises. So that idea of conducting experiments, um, they're when someone who does not identify as gay um, engages in same-sex activity is often called experimenting at the rear of his premises. This is a straightforward implication. Uh, anal sex is going on. Um, and then Dr. Stevenson says to which he has given this friend of his a key. So We've got that element. Uh, we've got references to disgrace, to uh, Jekyll exposing himself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these sort of 
these things that in the context of the conversation are straightforward and relatively innocent, but can also easily be read as coding for um, sexual activity, particularly between men. 